share my screen. That's my tabs as well. There you go, perfect. So the boy just does it in tabs. I do have a full screen. Hopefully you can see my full screen. Can you? Yeah, you can see my full screen. Perfect. Okay, nice one. So hello everyone. I've just got Fifi as well. And welcome to my session on how to create habits and build routines. So this is something I've been thinking about for a bit of time and is really part of the, the book I'm writing as well. So kind of 9,000 words into that right now. And I find that a big part about what I want to write about, about how to start is really about working on yourself first. So a lot of this comes from reading different books on self-help, but also from my own time invested in sort of my own habits and working out what works for me that I think might be helpful for you as well. Obviously, everyone's different. And of course, that's true with pretty much everything in life. But there are some basic takeaways that I think could be useful for you and hopefully can help you build some habits and create some routines. So on this first slide, <clears throat> we've got what I've kind of done before as my, as my model for um, creating habits where I see each habit as really a pillar of a part of a building, an Acropolis, where the Acropolis is really your routine. So the routine is made up of pillars of habits and they support one another to build that routine at the top level. And for me, this way of visualizing really helps me see how they're all interlinked as habits are and that they really kind of come together, to support you as a person, support your routine, and support your well-being more more generally. So that's the kind of visualization I always have in my head whenever I'm thinking about habits. So on to the first slide, if I can click that. Okay, I can. So what do I know? Uh, it's a pretty good question. And here's some kind of basic stuff in terms of where I'm at with my habits and what I do on a regular basis. So I'm on a 435 day meditation streak. So that's pretty good. So I'm using Headspace every day for 10 minutes. And pretty much that's in small ways change my life to be honest so that routine building that habit that daily consistency i've seen big returns on over the long term so that has been a habit that i looked to develop after i was struggling with suicidal thoughts back in december 2019 and really from then i haven't touching all the wood i can of course really felt the same way since so i think that's been a big change in my life and i always that that sort of feeds into the bigger picture of the why behind what you do and needing it to, to have that that built in from day one as well of like a good enough reason to do the habit like it's not good enough to be like oh, i just want to be fitter it's why do you want to be fitter because you want to be able to spend time with your kids you want to be able to go and do x or y like there's got to be a good why behind what you do as well and of course running you know it's a big part of my life it wasn't always a, in fact i was one of the slowest there when i first died so for me getting into it and improving i've seen the increases and the returns on what I've been doing by putting in the consistent work. And I think out of all the pillars on my Acropolis, that's the middle one. That's the most important one that without spending time on it, I wouldn't be as effective everywhere else as well. So I think that comes back to the message here that I'm going to sort of share across the next few slides is basically it's about starting with one routine first, one habit first, and then building that across into, into a wider routine as well. And then, of course, I do a lot of reading as well. So I'm currently on my seventh book. Uh, for 2021, uh, about to finish it as well. I've got a thousand page book on Winston Churchill. So for me, reading, I kind of make it a necessity of doing it every day. And that's another kind of part of what do I know about habits? I know it because I do this stuff every day as well. And then on to the next slide. So the first part of seeing habits, I think, comes back to distractions. Like we all love and loathe this thing here, which takes up all of our time both spare time and during the day as well. And I think getting in control of your phone usage is the most important thing to building habits. And it's completely misrepresented and completely underrated when people come to build habits as well. They think they could control their phone without doing anything about it. The first thing to realize is that it's designed to be addictive, yeah? It wants your attention. You have to really understand what attention you want to give it. And to do that, decide. Look at the apps you've got and decide which ones are actually worth your time. For me, that means removing Snapchat, removing Twitter, um, removing like, basically anything else that I don't think is valuable enough to me or doesn't actually contribute to, to who I am or what I want to actually see unnoticed or without me choosing to do so as well. 
The second point here, turning off the notification counters on the apps that are left. So apart from if you call me, or if you apart from if you message me directly, then it won't tick up on a notification counter. See those little red dots? That's designed to be very addictive as well. It's designed to make you click it and open it and see, oh, let's just see if I've got another notification. Turn it off. There's just no point. Like just having an extra notification come in. What's the point in that? Like it doesn't change your life and it's never urgent. You think it's urgent because it's designed that way, but it never is. The only things that I see as urgent are phone calls and say direct WhatsApp messages. So those are the two sort of streams I have that people can message me and I will respond quickly, but everything else is a big no-go. And that comes to a wider thing here of leave your phone and do not disturb. <laughs> I think my sister perhaps is the worst for this. She used to have it flash and make a sound. And I was like, whoa, that is some addictive tendencies, man. That is absolutely crazy. So leave it and do not disturb, turn off the sound and don't get any notifications on your home screen. Only the ones that you think are relevant, i.e. the direct messages should come up there. Everything else that, oh, your friend on Facebook um, liked your picture, get it gone. Just no reason for it. Like a completely pointless notification that's just taking away from your habits, your activities, everything else you want to get involved with as well. So that I think is a really solid starting place in terms of making your phone boring. There's a huge number of articles out there about how to do it. But with those three steps, I think you're a good length of the way across as well. So on to the next one, refining your focus. So this is a similar aspect. It's almost applying the mindset that we just had towards the phone to the rest of your life as well. Stop wasting your time with drama and negative people. Like the amount of people I used to sort of talk to regularly or used to spend time with is being decreased massively into just the ones that I think actually add to my life. There's both drains and sinks are the two types of people. And a lot of them really will drain your energy. I will take you away, tell you you can't do things, be very negative about your any aspirations that you have. And you have sinks, people that fill you up, people that make you feel good and are with you for the long term and want the best for you. Surround yourself with sinks, not drains. That's a really big point. And avoid the drama. Like oh, there's so much just bullshit out there about people talking, oh, this person did this, this person does that. No one cares. Like about people, it doesn't matter. It's all about what the goals are, what the impact is, and what your progress is as well. There's a little saying about, I won't go into it, but it's about people who talk about ideas and people who talk about people. You want to be people who be with people who talk about ideas more than those who talk about people. And then the second one, limit the amount of entertainment you consume. So this is a big one. I know a lot of us like to, to spend time doing or watching Netflix or um, reading or doing X and Y. If you want to refine your focus, you've got to take a look at that. Obviously, we need a balanced lifestyle. And I'm kind of coming at it from probably almost a workaholic vibe of like being too much. So obviously it takes a pinch of salt, but really you want to make sure that you're looking at what you consume and thinking of it like an information diet. So what am I taking in all the time? What am I consuming? Is this useful to me? No, if it's not useful. Cut it out or at least limit it. So if you're watching like two, three, four episodes in an evening just think it's too it's too good enough yeah it probably is cool and then i'll spend the other hour doing something else like you have the time you just haven't necessarily directed in the right places and a really good way of breaking the habit loop with watching tv programs watching films is to watch them 15 minutes into the next episode because that's where the habit the addiction comes in is you towards the end of the episode they build up the hype for the next one and then you watch the next one it solves the problem in the first 10 50 minutes so watch it up until the first 10, 15 minutes and then stop. And then when you come back to it, it will be way less addictive and you won't have to keep watching the next one to find out what happens because you've already worked out what the answer is as well. And the third one, big one as well, especially coronavirus modern times, turn off your news. Like, it's just not urgent. Like daily updates about, oh, this many people have got COVID today. It doesn't matter. Like, I can't do anything about it. It's outside my control. Why are you telling me? So I think, the really important part there is seeing it that you see the news when you want to rather than when bbc tells you it's urgent like it's never urgent yeah like 99.99 percent .99 of news stories just aren't relevant or aren't actually significant to your world so when you see it that way really it doesn't matter what's happening out there and you shouldn't have to involve yourself with it and then next one i think this is really important as well is valuing your word so your default answer to requests should be no if you ask me to do something, my default answer most of the time is no. So parents say, oh, I want to go for a walk. No, not really. Um, and then when you say yes, it becomes something you fully mean to do as well. So 
here when I give my word, for me, it means a lot in the sense that I am fully committing to it and I'm really valuing that time, valuing that choice as something that I fully intend to do. And that also means that turn it regardless of the nerves because we all get the nerves. We all feel, oh shit, like, do I actually want to do this? I'm not sure. Just still go along. And worst case scenario, you turn it for five minutes and then you can always turn back afterwards. The hardest part with every habit, with anything you do is the first five minutes. Get over the first five minutes and it becomes so much easier. And that's the same with commitments. It's go along, see how it goes. You can always drop out if it's, if it's shit. Like just start, yeah? That's the really important part. And then getting a good goal. So try new activities to work out what you actually enjoy doing. So a lot of us don't really know what we like. That's fair enough. Like, how can you? There's so much stuff out there. So just keep trying stuff. And eventually you'll find your way of exercising, your way of doing relaxing of hobbies or anything that you actually enjoy. For me, I enjoy running most of the time. <laughs> That's a caveat, most of the time, but I enjoy it. So find your way of exercising. Don't have to compel or sort of strive yourself to fit a square peg into a round hole by doing something you don't actually enjoy because in the long term it just won't be fun it'll just be an absolute chore to go and do so find a version of exercise a version of a hobby a x y and z that you actually do enjoy but of course remember you won't enjoy it all the time i don't always enjoy running in fact this morning i didn't really want to go out i had a session in the diary it was like 20 minutes warm up 50 minutes at 10k to half marathon pace and then 50 minutes cool down and i was like mate it's like three degrees i don't really want to go out and do a hard session at like a pace that i don't really know how fast i am and i have a lot of pressure on myself for getting the right speed and making sure that i'm fit for events but once i'd realized that i was like just put the shoes on go and do the first two or three minutes you can always stop halfway through and as soon as i started that 15 minutes that hard on at like 314k pace just kept at it and it was probably the most consistent session I've ever done and came back and I was like, you know what? I feel good. I feel pumped for the day. So remember the hardest part is starting. It's not the part afterwards. So just focus on putting the shoes on, getting out and starting rather than thinking about, oh, won't it be so tough and I'm three quarters of the way through? Yes, it will be, but just focus on the first bit first. And then with a goal you've got in mind, set a smart goal. We all know what they are. Um, and then from smart goals, write out the step-by-step -step process. So a lot of us miss this part. We kind of go, here's big goal. It's attainable, realistic, measurable, cool. But then we miss the part of how to actually do it. So you might have a top level strategy goal. You want to write down the tactics behind how to achieve it as well. So that could mean literally talking about it as if you were coming across this for the first time. So put shoes on, open door, walk out for run, go for run come back, take your shoes off. It can be as simple as that, yeah? But as long as you're visualizing the process and you're seeing the steps that it requires to take action, that's the really important part here. And then what is a good habit? Good habit is consistent in your life. So you progress it with it every week. It does not mean every day. This is a big one. People love streaks. I, in fact, used streaks to start this, didn't I? I said I'm on a 435-day headspace streak because it gives credibility. It sounds cool. Everyone loves it. It gives it a like on social. Cool. But when you miss a day, it'll feel like, whoa, ah, uh, am I starting from one again? No, you're not. You've done like 435 days out of 436, the 437th day, like you're not starting from zero. That's the really important part. So making it consistent, but not necessarily daily is really key. And also being resilient to change. So I run in the winter, I run in the summer, regardless of the weather. And if I'm parents, like, oh, you know, it's raining outside, you sure you're out? I don't really care. It doesn't really matter. I'm still going out regardless. So make it resilient as well. And then progressing you towards your goals. Of course, it needs to be relevant. So it needs to actually help you hit your goals as well and not progress you away from them. And a good habit is not reliant on motivation. You don't give it a second thought. So right now, the fact that I've been able to build habits on top of one another comes down to in large part because I'm not thinking about them. I'm not trying to hype myself up motivation wise. It just happens. I'm just used to it. So really think about that in the sense of you don't want to have to always consume a motivational video to go out and do something. You want to just get into a routine of doing it. And eventually that will just come. A classic is 21 days. After that, it'll become so much easier. And it always does. Aiming for a streak, talked about before. Don't aim for a streak. Just aim for consistency. And then don't be dependent on other people as well. Obviously, when you start out, it might be easier to go to the gym with someone or go for a run with someone, but 
really you want to make sure that it's independent of them because there'll be a day when they won't turn up and you'll be like, oh, mm, I don't really want to go now. And because you're relying on that person, it means that you won't progress with the habit and it'll just, you'll fall behind with them as well. So as long as you do it maybe half with someone, half by yourself when you're starting out, cool. But make sure you are dependent as soon as you can be. And then kind of to summarize, what I've got is that each habit is a pillar of your life. They so each support one another to create a solid foundation of your life. So seeing it again back in this Greek Acropolis style where each habit is a pillar and the whole Acropolis is your routine. And I think really by performing daily goals, daily habits consistently, you'll see big returns in terms of any goals you want to achieve. And for me, that's really the foundation of, of my life and what I do both in work and outside of work as well. So yeah, that's what I've got for you. And I think that's pretty well on time as well. So I'll just stop sharing my screen and then feel free to ask me any questions. Well, it felt kind of like you were screaming at me in lowercase. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's so to the point, but this is also like my inner voice, just what tells me to do, <laughs> but not in a shouting way. <laughs> so this was, yeah. That's why I didn't even look straight in your slides all, uh, a lot of the time because I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> it's cool. Oh, yeah. Shit. <laughs> yeah, but I have a quick point with the news, though. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I also do this, actually, but it feels like when I miss some sort of news or some sort of event. Bye-bye. Uh, so, so, yeah, some sort of event. Uh, and then I talk to somebody and they're like, oh, this happened and this happened. I'm like, oh, I didn't know. I don't follow the news. And they're like, you don't follow the news? Like, why? It's like, it looks, it feels like somebody just looks at me as, I don't know, like not intelligent or something that I fo don't follow the news, even though they are not relevant. Wow. Volcano erupted in the uh, Italy. I mean, yeah, sure. It's okay. But like, as Charlie said, it, it doesn't really change anything in my life. So if I spend some time just reading those articles, I don't know, it changes, changes nothing. So this is something I feel like needs a just slight discussion. Mm. Yeah, so when you kind of come across someone who's talking about when they've actually read the news and you're being perceived as not being understanding the world around you, I think the key thing to remember is yeah. like, that's their problem as well like <laughs> yeah, yeah. that is pretty much like culture loves to have us engaged all the time and it's pretty normal to read the news daily and read it all the time and be up to date like having your notifications on that's normal yeah what we're talking about here is not normal so i think to embrace that is to be like yeah i don't know about it because i don't read the news cool can you let me know about it now if you think it's relevant great and then they give you a little summary of the article they give you a little summary of the whole situation and then you've got your news in about 10 seconds that you would have to otherwise read like in 10 minutes so it's so much easier as well yeah totally yeah, that's great. Great. yeah i love that I, I think that's um i've i've not had the bbc news app for like two years now i deleted it and at the <laughs> first i was just like ah i'm gonna like how will I cope? And I, my dad gets like a thing called The Week, which is mm. like a, um, a summary of like loads of different news sources from around the world. And then I just spend like two hours on the Saturday morning and I just read that. So I'm like fully informed. But then also if something happens and I'm not aware of it, nine times out of 10, it comes up in conversation. You go, oh, I didn't realize that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if you feel you're being judged for it, just say, look, this is an intentional thing. I found the news way too distracting and it's affecting my mental health. What can they say to that? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably another big point as well, is, is that the negative impact it has as well. Like, it's not just wasting time. It's also, for me, negative. Like, I feel like when I read the news, it's a personality thing as well. But for me, it's like, it's outside of my control. Like, I, I can't do anything about it. So when there's like, oh, big global issue that you need to help solve, I can't do anything about it. Maybe I can talk about it on social or share on my story, but like, it doesn't change anything. So for me, it's like, delete the stuff that i can't impact and focus on the stuff that i can and scaling that bit yeah i think it's a very stoic view of looking at things isn't it i mean someone like jordan peterson he goes as far i don't know if anyone knows jordan peterson um yeah, yeah. so he's like yeah he's a huge like psychology professor so he goes as far as not even having a television 
at home and he's he's like oh he he hasn't watched the news since 1980 something it was like oh, okay because he also like you said charlie finds it really negative mm. and also it's always about getting your attention and it has to be negative because i think as human beings we pay more attention to the negative stuff it gets the attention more you know they get more clicks and all that kind of stuff so it's about like tuning off me personally i just use blogs it's faster it's easier it's accessible to me and i don't spend ages on it so yeah yeah definitely i think that speaks as well for seeing the bigger picture mm. so so often when we're faced with news stories it focuses on the daily or the the weekly or the kind of here's the immediate term impact but actually when you look the bigger picture i mean the most obvious one is the daily cases of coronavirus you look at daily it means nothing in context so when you actually put that with a sort of how the last 12 months have looked a bit more realistic you actually get to understand what's happening rather than just being told here's a big scary number like care about it it's like here's a scary number against other numbers that you should probably consider it's actually coming down or actually going up or whatever you can't see the picture unless you see it in comparison to the rest of the story as well got anything else i think i think you might be making a little sound let me just try this okay yeah Sorry, yeah, I had like a little, a little beeping sound, but that's, that's all good. I thought it was me. I was taking off my headphones, looking around, thought it was an alarm going off. <laughs> Sorry. I thought you said that. Nice. Uh, any other key thoughts on that or should I yeah wrap? sorry um charlie i just wanted to like because you did mention something about having your default answer as a no hmm. in, in once when what sense did you mean like just saying no to everything or just being like selective so for me it's not saying no to everything it's saying yes to some things so it means that i'm trying to make my word i think i do do that by a consequence important so if by saying no to basically everything so someone comes to you and says like hey do you want to do this do you want to help out with that like the we're so often told that just say yes to everything because opportunities come that way but really by by saying no to a lot of stuff you can start focusing on the stuff that's actually relevant to what you want to do obviously if i think it's a good opportunity and i want to do it yeah cool great let's do it but by having the default as no rather than yes it means that if I'm like, I don't think I actually want to do this, I can lean into that and just say no. Like especially when it comes to the sort of stuff that you think's easy, where your friends are like, oh, want to go pub? No. <laughs> cool. Like obviously there'll be times when I'm like, yeah, I do want to go pub. Great. But like I think the key part is seeing it as my default answer is no to your question. But when I say yes, it's a lot higher value in the sense that I do fully commit and fully intend to do it. Oh, I get your point. So basically, don't be like a yes person and don't keep saying yes if you know you won't commit really to what you mm. want to do. Yeah. Right, yeah, I guess about that control, isn't it? About putting the control in your own hands rather than in other people. Because when pe we, people ask things of us, automatically we feel indebted to say yes to that thing because they've asked us, oh, it feels good that they've asked me to do that thing. But actually that might be completely incapacitable like just haven't got the time i've got the capacity i can't do that or i don't want to do it even um were you going to come into that there you know? oh no i was just gonna ask a different question um yeah oh yeah i, yeah, I find the netflix point interesting about um you know really limiting that just because um of a thought i was kind of listening to on a podcast about how the dopamine that we release and give to ourselves is actually one of the reasons why we do procrastinate on like the tasks we don't find as enjoyable because let's say in the morning the first thing you do is hop out and then play some games or let's say you watch netflix to kind of get into the morning wherever because that's a really high dopamine level activity when you do go down and you're doing some work that you don't find as enjoyable it's gonna be a lot harder to do because you're coming down from that rush that you've had in the morning so would you say as a result of that it'd be better to do those habits like running like meditating in the morning as opposed to doing it later in the day because you're then coming down so would would it realistically be more easier to do it if you're doing mm. it at the start? So work with what suits you, of course, this is going to be different for everyone. But for me, I, there's a few reasons why I try and stack things in the morning. The first one is because you get two chances at it. So if I miss my run in the morning, I can do it in the evening and it's still the same day. If you miss it in the evening, it's the next day. And then you're already behind in your head and you're already playing catch up. 
So by doing it in the morning, you have two chances rather than one is the way I see it. And also on a wider point, I get to see that I'm starting my day well. So I feel like I'm starting it with positivity. I'm starting it with having achieved something already before I come to do the next task. And if it's the hardest thing of my day of like going out for the run this morning, then I've already done the hardest thing. Everything else in the day is easy. So by seeing it that way, I think really helps me, but also the dopamine, I think that's definitely very true is by trying to detract yourself from doing the easy thing first and doing the hard thing first. I think you'll find a lot of benefit by doing the latter. And in fact, I think I saw Stephen Bartlett had a good post on this where he talked about anything that's easy, you should be really cynical of. Like, why is this easy? Like, what's the point in this? Like, wh why? What's the result? But anything that's hard, it almost by default has a positive outcome, a positive sort of response. And it's actually good for you in the long term. Easy is short term, hard is long term. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, that's pretty much everything I've got for you uh, today. Right, I'll give you the uh, recording.